Hello, I am Margaret Gam, uh, Director of Special Collections and Archives at the University of Iowa Libraries, and I would like to thank you for joining us today. I would also like to acknowledge that the University of Iowa is located on the historical homelands of over 15 tribal nations the Omaha Tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki, and Ho Chunk Nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. We acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribal nations, the treaties that were used to remove them, and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. To help you start your own exploration of these Iowa histories of Iowa and its peoples, we encourage you <clears throat> Uh, we encourage you to take a look at the links provided in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube video description. So today's speaker is Patrick Olson of Patrick Olson Rare Books. Patrick first joined the rare book trade in Chicago during his junior year of college. Four years later, after receiving his MS in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, he spent 10 years in special collections and taught rare book cataloging for six years for the University of Illinois. I met Pat when he was a curator here at Iowa, where he taught me just a little bit of what he knows. Uh, Pat last spoke at Iowa Bibliophiles in September 2013, I had to look this up, on 15th century books, specifically the 14 incunabula that he had recently acquired for special collections. He discussed the antiquarian book market and the process undertaken to acquire the books, so I think that today's topic is uh, just an update, perhaps, from that 2013 yeah. talk, uh, and an update with a twist. So welcome back, Pat. Thank you, Margaret, for that great introduction. Yeah, that, that takes me back. I, I, I thought of that my my first Iowa Bibliophiles appearance. That was a fun time. Um, but yeah, thank you for having me back. Uh, like Margaret said, I'm Pat uh, or Patrick Olson. I go by both. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I work alone out of the house and I know there are people out there watching and there's some comfort in just knowing that I am among other people for a change. Um, so yeah, as, as Margaret uh, covered, I transitioned to book selling three years ago uh, from librarianship. And so I uh, did kind of bounce around, made a small tour of the big 10 schools, um, started out in uh, Champaign-Urbana and then on to uh, then I came out east, and then I went to Iowa, and then Michigan State University, um, and uh, I moved out to Lowell, uh, about 20 miles north of Boston, when my wife took a job out here a few years ago. So, some of you are probably familiar with the uh, the uh, you know, kind of the the academic leapfrog that goes with uh, dual career couples in higher ed, and so this is sort of a way to a way to kind of put an end to that. So I'm mobile now. Um, I do have a real soft spot for Iowa, uh, for those who, um, you know, I guess, I guess we've covered that I worked there, uh, and it was a lot of good times. It was brief, but I really enjoyed my time there, and so I'm very happy to kind of be here and, and talk about where I'm at now, um, and, you know, I know you guys, uh, Iowa has been a good, like, a, a great customer, and so I want to, I want to thank you guys. You're one of the earliest, um, and I was great, you know, I grateful to Margaret, you know, typically I do, you know, I, I keep purchases confidential. So it's kind of fun to have an invitation to talk more about books that I've sold to Iowa, um, you know, and there, maybe, maybe there are non-Iowans listening in and, and getting all the dirt, but I know you guys are in the business of sharing things. And so this, this may help do that a little bit. Um, so yeah, I do, I know what you bought last summer, some things anyway. And actually, I think there's an Amazon reboot I saw for this, this, I don't know if it's a movie or TV series, but I, I'm getting ads on Twitter, probably because I made this slide and they're like, you know, mapping my keystrokes. I'll have to investigate that later. But without further ado, let's talk about some of the things I've sold to Iowa. Now, first, I, I don't know if anyone uh, follows the Henry Southern uh twitter feed it's pretty fantastic oliver oliver is his name the guy who runs it and i, I feel like this is a great kind of uh a tongue in cheek tongue in cheek sort of synopsis of the life cycle of a book um you kind of can see where the bookseller falls 
So as, as librarians, you know, we, I, you know, I say we, I, I, I guess I still have a bit of librarian in me. You know, we're kind of used to seeing rare books in very controlled environments, a special collection setting. Um, at worst, maybe at a fancy book fair with, you know, open bottles of champagne around. Uh, but their origins can be a lot more colorful. And I, I want to talk tonight about some of the book history that lies between uh, what we think of as, as provenance, um, which typically excludes the agent of immediate sale, uh, who happens to be just the current owner. You know, I feel like that um, that agent of sale often gets kind of in the moment left out of this concept of provenance. Uh, and then to talk a bit about your own acquisition. Um, so I think you'll learn a little more about the books at Iowa, some of the books, um, some of the details that did not land in my final descriptions and something a little bit uh, about the larger rare book trade as well. So we'll start, we'll start with the crowd. This is one of my favorites and I, I, I like to think of it as a crowd pleaser. Um, you know, we, we had a chained binding at Michigan State University and I trotted it out all the time for classes. People, people loved it. And there was really, um, it, at least in my mind, there was really no more visual more powerful visual statement about the value of, of books in early modern Europe, um, that they had to be chained to, to lecterns and bookcases for security purposes. Um, and so I bought this uh, early on in, in my, my, you know, still kind of brief young tenure as a bookseller. Um, it was one of the first lots in an auction, this was in France, with an artificially low estimate, you know, it was like two or, Two to three hundred euros or something, and yeah, you know, it's you know they're just trying to trying to bring in the bidders to drive it up. Um, but I was still excited about it. I I had come off the the heels of uh, you know my first um, I think it's just my first catalog, and it it did it did better than I better than I thought. Um, and uh, so I was pretty excited that this might be something that I could buy. Now we you know, especially during the pandemic, working from home, we kind of joke about working from home in our, in our pajamas. But I'll be completely honest with you and, and let you know that I did actually buy that chain binding in my pajamas before I had showered. Uh, so I, I buy most of my inventory from Europe, um, a lot of it from auctions. And some of those auctions start at, at 10, even 9 a.m., uh, which depending on the time of year is five or six hours ahead of East Coast time. And so there have been plenty of mornings where I've had to get up, roll out of bed at four o'clock in the morning, stroll over to, you know, it's more like stumble over to the computer uh, and, and bid on these things and hope for the best. Um, and so this, this is what happened with that, that chain binding. I, I, in the end, I did, you know, I did win it, which is awesome. I was pretty giddy with excitement. Um, you know, I, I jumped in the shower afterwards, remember, I mean, my PJs, uh, and then I realized that I, I, I completely forgot that I was bidding in euros and not American dollars, um, which, which wasn't, you know, a, a huge, it's not, you know, not like a, um, a bankrupting kind of difference. But again, I was, I was just out of my first catalog. I had some money to spend, but, you know, it's like, I'm, you know. I'm not a third generation bookseller here. Um, and, you know, and as, you know, I'm, a, I'm no financial maverick. And so as a, as a rule, uh, even though I'm insured, I, I generally don't buy something I, I can't afford to lose, kind of planning for worst case scenario. The assumption being that I'm, I'm, I will lose very few things. Uh, and it's true that, that booksellers do generally assume much more risk than the end buyer. Um, but this, this was a substantial investment for me. Um, and it, it turned out to be more, more of an investment than I bargained for once I you know, got back to my computer and did the exchange rate. Um, but I was still happy to have it. Uh, and as a, as a new business, you know, I was looking for things that I, would, uh, I thought I could sell quickly. Um, you know, I, I, I knew that uh, something like a chain binding, again, I come from uh, the academic library setting, and I knew that this would have great appeal in uh, instruction, outreach, exhibit settings, 
And so I thought, even though it, would, it, it was gonna be expensive that I had a fair chance of selling it before too long. Um, and anything that sits too long, especially as, as a new business, it really kind of slows, slows down your growth. Uh, you know, it's just like investing in your retirement account. And they say, do it, do it while you're, you're young and as, as much as you can. Um, and so I tried to apply kind of the same principle to, to building the business. Because uh, the, the idea uh, was to uh, pursue a wage that would keep me off the job market. So when I started this, like it's like, I knew, I, I figured I'd sell some books. Like I wasn't going to lose money just because I kept my expenses so low. But the question is, you know, can I, uh, will I make enough um, to avoid having to look for a different job? You know, that was the, the terrifying thing when I started out. And unfortunately, so far, I've, I've, you know, I'm making a living. And so no complaints. I enjoy it very much. Um, but in any case, to get back to this book, you know, I want it. It's time and it's time to pay for it. I got to pay the auction house for it, which was really a, a, a crash course in what are very common complexities when buying things from from overseas. Um, you know, Payment by wire transfer is kind of the, the standard way to do things, uh, which are really difficult with um, your, your standard brick and mortar American banks. Um, and I, I did my, my, you know, wire transfers the first six months or so through my local bank. You know, you got to fill out paperwork, take it to the bank branch. You know, they, they approve it and they send it through their system. It's all extremely antiquated. Um, but you know the the bright spot was the the banker here in downtown Lowell, the branch manager. She, she I mean she she saw this you know my printouts for this book. She loved this chain binding. So there is a banker in downtown Lowell who knows about this and is really excited about it. Um, it's and it's kind of funny, you know. It's sort of an an, uh, an unusual occupation for for them to deal with, I think. And and they they kind of got into it. Um, so in any case, you know, I I, I finally you know, pay for the book, wire transfers, when you route them through the traditional banking system, you know, every, they go through a number of banks, every bank takes its cut. And so the final amount was not, you know, what it was supposed to be when it finally got to the auction house. So you got to send a little bit more money to cover it. It's all very tedious. I now, I know, um, I now use transfer wise. If anybody finds themselves in the need of, of doing overseas transfers, transfer wise is the way to go. Um, so great, paid for the book. The other thing about auction houses, maybe half of them, at least in Europe, have their own shipping department. This auction house did not. So, you know, I got to figure out, I, I got to find someone to sort of collect this book for me on my behalf and ship it to me. Uh, fortunately, you know, the auction house, they've done this before, they can recommend a number of companies. Um, but it, it isn't cheap. You know, I uh, ended up spending, I think it was over $300 to have the book collected and shipped, um, which is, you know, ex ex expensive, not incredibly unusual. Like if I, if I can get shipping for under $100 from an auction house, I'm usually uh, pretty ecstatic. Um, but it's, you know, I, you know, it's getting some of these books from overseas is uh, there are a lot of steps to it. It's not straightforward. Um, and so it is, I, I like to think it is kind of a service of, of bringing this stuff into the North American market. Um, but yeah, and again, this, these are, I don't deal in a whole lot of English material. These are largely continental auction houses. And, and so I basically live in Google Translate. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I know enough of some languages to kind of, to get by. But, you know, when I'm corresponding with these places, like I, I, I really, I, Google Translate is always open in my browser and I'm always in it. Um, and it works, it works well enough. And if you've, if you've studied some languages, you can kind of get a sense of where, uh, where your translation might be falling through and tweak it. But um, yeah, tedious. Um, so then, yeah, book is collected, it's shipped. And then the, you just got to have faith in the supply chain. Um, and I, I saw on Twitter today, Eric was, uh, you know, had some problems with FedEx. Um, Eric, I think I saw you resolve that. Yeah, I think I saw you resolve that. <laughs> but, Actually, um, Twitter resolved that. Uh, okay, good. 
it's funny it's, it left it, customs in two hours <laughs> yeah it's 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 no fun um and uh and it can it can be a really difficult to get things sometimes things just wind up in especially with the with the postal service things wind up in customs they could sit there for three four weeks with no explanation and then suddenly one day it starts to move um and you kind of just have to to kind of roll with the punches and have faith in the system as, as slow and as maddening as it can be. Um, I haven't lost anything yet, which, which gives me comfort. Everything has arrived eventually. Uh, but yeah, it's, it can be a real headache. Um, especially for the bookseller, you know, you, you kind of have to plan for these delays and, and, you know, now I have a bit of a backlog. Um, but early on I didn't. And so trying to get stuff here as quickly as possible was, was really important. Um, all to say, it's not always a, you know, a business for the faint of heart. You've got to, you know, put trust in things out of your control. Um, and which can be hard when you've, you know, wired a lot of money overseas and you just, you know, part of you just wonders, is it going to get here? Um, but finally the chain binding arrives. I'm thrilled. It's fantastic. And one thing I really liked about this uh was its size it's really it, you know and again i'm i'm looking at the photos from the uh the auction houses website and their measurement like this is a this is a really small chain binding you know typically they're um uh, larger kind of lectern books folios large quartos that kind of thing smaller format books uh in chain bindings are, are certainly not you know unheard of as you see here but they're less common and so i um uh, I actually spent, I was with my wife who was in Providence, Rhode Island for a week uh, for work. I went down to visit her for a couple of days and I spent a day at a coffee shop in Providence going through the online cat catalog of the chain library at uh, Hereford Cathedral in England uh, and, and like charting, you know, making a spreadsheet of all the, you know, the recorded sizes for all of their bindings that had chains or had evidence of chains. Um, and I think I, I stopped once I had like 500 books. And I was like, this is a, a pretty, this is a reasonable sample size. Um, and, uh, and I believe your, uh, uh, you know, Iowa, I believe your chained binding is, I think that book is maybe 15.1 centimeters tall. I found at uh, Hereford Cathedral, 3.6% of chain books were 16 centimeters or less. Um, those of you who catalog will know that in cataloging, you always round up to the, you know, the next whole number. So 15.1 becomes 16. So I, I, I think it's fair to say that yours is, is more like in the, the top 3% of, you know, like the world's smallest chain bindings. So good work, good work. Um, and, and finally it was, uh, I, you know, I received multiple orders for it. Uh, it's usually a sure sign that it was underpriced, um, but it was, you know, it's, uh, it also helped, it, it kind of gives me a sense of what other people are looking for and it kind of helped me place other things later on, which is nice. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a reminder that, that some of the best stuff, you know, never even makes it to catalog because when I get orders for multiple orders, I can kind of use that information and, and help other people find stuff. So, all right, enough about the chain binding and I'll, I'll leave plenty of questions for or plenty of time for questions. Okay. Um, so this was another one I was really excited about. So I sell mostly to U.S. institutions, mostly academic libraries, uh, many of them public, uh, I think most of them public universities, um, and which is, you know, something I, I guess I really believe in. Uh, and, you know, I'm like, you know, everyone, I'm well aware that these collections reflect decades, if not centuries, of collecting traditional Western high spots. Um, I, I mean, I, I think every Big Ten library probably has the, the complete set of Dickens in the first edition. Um, you know, just for people were, were, you know, zealous about this kind of stuff for so long. Um, and so, I, you know, I want to help diversify those collections too, and to kind of help find material that can illuminate the cultural heritage of everyone who walks through your doors. Um, now, finding representation of the marginalized, of the oppressed, and especially positive representation 
um, is, is tricky, you know, when you work with pre-1830 European material, which is, is what I focus on. Um, and so after my, my first catalog, I, I decided to, to attempt a catalog um, that was really kind of dedicated to the experience of, of people of color in early modern Europe, um, knowing that this was probably not going to be uh, all that straightforward. Um, and it did, uh, basically after I sent out that first, my first catalog, I, I spent probably eight, nine months, you know, reading the secondary literature, checking citations, seeking early editions of those authors' primary sources. Um, and basically, you know, I, I came away with the realization that the evidence of those lives is, is out there uh, waiting to be found, but it's just buried and scattered across so many different genres um, because nobody was, was writing about, you know, the, for example, the black experience in 16th century Europe. Um, and so when it, when it came, to, to shop, you know, shopping for these things and sourcing the inventory. Um, a general word about this, you know, and it, 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 that process really kind of comes in two varieties. There's browsing upcoming auctions and sometimes booksellers online inventory. And, and then there's searching, you know, the, uh, you know, the big marketplaces, big biblio, whatever, for like specific authors, titles, imprints, that kind of thing. Now, when you're doing the latter, you're generally hoping for several conditions to kind of come together. One, you know, you, you hope that you can just find the thing at all. Uh, two, you hope that it's not too expensive. Uh, and three, you hope that there aren't multiple copies already available. Um, and, and this can be a high bar because some things just aren't obtainable. Uh, and the value of many things is, is widely understood and they're already understandably expensive. Uh, Phyllis Wheatley is a great example of that. Um, you are not going to get a first edition of her poems at any kind of bargain price. Uh, and sometimes the book is too easily obtainable. Um, even if it's tremendously important and you've no hope uh, of making a quick profitable sale, simply because the supply or the supply just kind of exceeds the demand. There are too many copies floating around out there and not enough buyers. And that, that's true of a lot of, you know, really, really interesting, important works. Um, so the hope, you know, what I hope for is that I find just one copy and that the seller hasn't noticed the value that I have in the book. And that's, you know, that, that's what you want. Um, and there were, I, I did have some successes working on this catalog. Uh, some of this stuff was kind of, um, it turned out to be really, you know, important uh, and, and helped sort of flesh out the story of people of color in early modern Europe. Um, uh, some of it was available. I managed to, you know, to pick up the earliest obtainable work uh, by Europe's first black author. Um, there was this one copy available for a song, you know, like that, that, that was uh, fantastic to be able to find that. Um, I, I picked up like every scattered trace of Juan Latino I could find. For those who don't know, Juan Latino was a, a 16th century Spanish um, professor and poet um, and, and generally considered the, you know, the, the first published Black author in Europe. Um, though Afonso Alvarez who was a a Portuguese playwright in the 1530s. It looks like he did probably precede him. But in any case, Juan Latino, very important guy. Um, and then I, I did, and that's what you see here, uh, find some, and this is, again, relatively positive representation of a Black woman in 16th century Spain. Um, and so the image on the left is a snippet from this, this history of Granada from, I think it was, was it 1639? I'm looking at my own photo, 16, 1638. This is a complicated bibliographic history, like 1638, 1639, 1640. Um, and so this, this author in, in recounting the history of his, you know, his hometown Granada um, does discuss, you know, some of the, uh, the accomplished people of African descent that, that he knew that were, were in Granada at the time. Um, and so there's more, this is a book in two columns. There's more than a column's worth of biographical notices for, um, uh, for Juan Latino, previously mentioned, uh, an accomplished lawyer, uh, you know, a, 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 I guess a prominent priest and preacher. And finally, for a woman named Catalina de Soto, 
who was an artist and an embroiderer uh, and someone, uh, Pedraza, the author, um, you know, called the, the queen of black women on account of her beauty and her skill. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of prejudice in his account, uh, but, but for her to receive relatively complimentary treatment uh, and who faced additional prejudice just for being a woman was really extraordinary for uh, like a, a published work in 16th century Europe, um, which was, was borne out by the, the number of secondary sources that cited this work um, as an example of that. Uh, and, and so I, I guess I was, I was thrilled that I was able to, um, I guess, find this uh, copy of it and, and place it with Iowa. Um, and I, the, the confession here um, is that I had two copies. So this is un, unknown to you guys. Um, again, you know, you, as previously mentioned, the hope is that you find like one copy, low price, you, you know, you can buy it and, and make your margin great. Um, this was not both copies were not inexpensive. And so I was like, this is, I feel like this is going to be pushing it for what I am comfortable asking for this book. Uh, I, I don't know if this is going to sell. Um, it's, you know, uh, you know, for me, again, this is, you know, early on a pretty substantial investment to buy both of these. If, if none of them, sell, if, if neither of them sells, that, that kind of sucks. Uh, um, so again, you know, early on, I'm taking some gambles and I thought, uh, let's, let's go with it. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, you kind of hope, well, if they're too available, maybe one is less expensive. You can buy that one and kind of make a small margin and keep it in, in, in line with the price of the other, but they were pretty even. And so I just, I just had to get neither or both. Um, and, uh, I did, I bought both. Uh, would two people be willing to, to pay for those? Um, you know, that kind of, uh, an, an important snippet of history, but a pretty, you know, like really a pretty small snippet of history. Um, I, I don't know. Now, upon arrival, I noticed, you'll see the image on the right, uh, that the engraved title page uh, was engraved by a, a woman named Anna Hay in 17th century Spain. Um, so like a, a, a woman engraver in the 17th, 17th century Europe, um, not unheard of, but a, a pretty rare thing. Uh, you know, obviously most, most, um, I mean, you go through any, the engravings in, in all the books in your collections, you know, obviously the vast majority are going to be, be men. Um, and so I, I was thrilled to find this because it, it kind of helped, uh, um, shore up the price a little bit. It's like, well, it's, you know, it, uh, it, it kind of adds additional interest. Um, it adds, a uh, in a, again, it kind of fills one of those gaps in a lot of collections. And so if you can, you know, the more gaps you can fill with one title, um, you know, I think it, it really, um, it, it helps, it helps the, you know, the curators, the librarians, and it, it helps the booksellers kind of place this stuff. Um, now, fortunately, you know, I had these two copies. I, I did receive two orders for the book. Uh, and I, I will say, I, um, look, I think, you, I think you, you guys got the better, you guys got the best copy. All right. So just, know that know that um but uh you know and, and these are you know this this speaks you know especially the the anna hay title page kind of speaks to a, a larger theme in at least my experience as a bookseller which is that i i never well, i shouldn't say never i seldom fully understand what i'm buying um i buy virtually uh, things are often very minimally described, and there are few, if any, photos. Um, and, you know, on balance so far, the pleasant and profitable surprises have far outweighed the unpleasant. Uh, and, and so, you know, kind of armed with this experience, you know, I kind of feel emboldened to kind of just keep, keep doing it. So it's, sometimes it's like buying a grab bag and, and things arrive and it's, Sometimes things arrive and I just got to pass them along at cost because they're, you know, a disappointment, but sometimes things arrive and they're just, they're just so much more spectacular than I thought. Uh, and so I'll, I'll keep doing this. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's working so far. Okay. 
Oh, this is another, this is another good one. Um, all right. So I am, uh, I don't know if, I mean, you know, I know some of you kind of follow my catalog and things. I'm, uh, I'm really drawn to unusual bindings um, and, and to, to things kind of strange and unfamiliar in general, which presents some obvious challenges, right? So I, I, it keeps things interesting, but I find myself like, I, you know, what did I just buy? I have no idea what this is and now I need to figure it out. Um, and so I saw this in a, an auction at, this is actually Pacific Book Auctions in San Francisco. Some of you might be familiar with them. Um, this is a, a 1570 book of sermons. And I, I saw that drawing on the cover and I, I immediately thought, oh, that looks like, you know, indigenous Latin American art. Um, now I'm, I'm no expert, uh, but I, you know, I knew that PBA, uh, you know, commonly worked with material from Latin America. Um, there was a, an inscription on the title page with a place name of uh, Bay Chiapa, um, which, you know, it certainly did not sound uh, uh, European, and it, it did seem to reflect a place name that was used in Mexico, uh, which, it, you know, after I received it, it turned out to be the Franciscan convent. Uh, it, I think it was San Mateo Huichapan in Hidalgo, and I'm, I apologize if I'm not getting that pronunciation right. I don't know if Lisa Gardiner is listening but if she is, she'll know. Um, and so this, this collection of sermons was, it was kind of just the thing that Spanish missionaries would have brought with them to facilitate their own preaching to and conversion of Mexico's indigenous peoples. Um, so when this came up at auction, like that day, uh, I was feeling kind of low. I hadn't really been winning anything at auction. Um, you know, I, been stuck working in our dining room because some painting had cut off access to my office. And I was, I was just like, I was tired and just ready to go all in for this thing. Like, I don't care. This thing is really interesting. I want to figure out what this is. Uh, I, I'm going to do it. And as I mentioned, you know, in those early days, I really had no backlog. And so there was a scramble to bring in enough new inventory quickly enough to put out a new catalog and, and meet kind of the, the quarterly sales goals I set for myself. So it comes up and, uh, you know, would you believe that I was the only bidder for this thing? Uh, I, I got it for the open bid. I could hardly believe it. Um, it's like, oh, okay. Well, that's great. Um, and, uh, Again, this was one of the, the most ordered things I've handled. Again, a, sh a sure sign that it was, you know, underpriced. Um, but I, you know, you know, I got it for a, a fair price. And so I, I don't know, I guess I was, you know, the middle child in me, the guilt wants to, you know, pass the savings along to you. Um, but so the question, you know, yeah, six or seven orders for the thing. So how did Iowa get it? Um, how were you? the lucky library. So as previously suggested, I, I had my suspicions that this could be, you know, like, in, you know, uh, indigenous Latin American art, but I was, I was hardly capable of declaring this myself. And I would not expect anyone to take my word for it. Uh, so where, where do I go to figure this out? I, I checked in with my former colleague, Lisa Gardiner at the University of Iowa, uh, and asked if she, she could direct me to an, an actual expert. Uh, and in exchange, I offered her first refusal. Um, if you can put me in touch with a desperately needed lead, you can have first crack at the book. Uh, so she, she sent me to someone at Tulane University uh, who was clearly very knowledgeable. It's like, ah, but you should talk to so-and-so at the University of Oregon. Uh, so I worked with this person at the University of Oregon. I reached out to her who within like three hours responded with um, kind of the authoritative research that really formed the bedrock of my, my description for that book. Um, and I did, I did compensate her for her time. I do believe in paying a, a fair living wage when I enlist the help of others. Um, and this is all to say like this business really is as, as much about people as it is about the books. Um, you know, when, when a seller has something really unique. Uh, it's those relationships really matter. Um, and so I, I guess that's the, the long and the short. Why do you have this book? Well, you can, you know, thank, thank uh, Margaret and, and Lisa Gardiner. Yeah, it's teamwork, teamwork. 
Okay. Oh, all right. Oh, this is another one. You guys have bought a lot of like really interesting books. So kudos. Um, so again, I, you know, my interests are pretty wide ranging. Uh, you, I mentioned I'm interested in usual bindings, as you know, as just mentioned. Um, I'm really into school books, um, different kinds of manuals, anything that smacks of like everyday life, everyday living in early modern Europe. Um, and I, I'm also like really into unusual uses of print, you know, like the, the whole, just the, the entire gamut of early modern print culture just fascinates me. Um, and so, all right. So speaking of everyday living, let's talk about sin. So this here is like a, just a, a really fantastic manual from 1699 for sinners who are preparing for confession. So it's, it's a comprehensive catalog of sins. Each one is printed on kind of its own strip with a movable tab. Uh, and if you can kind of see in the, the photo, a couple of those tabs are, are pulled out from the border pocket. And the, the idea is that the, the owner would browse this catalog of sins and prick out you know, that, that slip from the border pocket when they're like, oh yes, that's a sin I've committed. I need to make sure I remember to confess that at my next confession. Um, and the preface talks about how it was, you know, you, you know, you're meant to use a, a needle or hat pin. And so it's, it's clear, and again, research has borne this out, that it was, it was really heavily intended for, uh, for, for women in early modern Europe. Um, and, and then once you go to confession, you know, you run through your catalog of sins that you've, you've you know, committed, you just tuck them back into that border pocket when you're done, and you repeat the process which I just thought was like, I'd never seen anything like this. This, is, this was so cool. Um, and, the, and the truth is like, it's hard. When I, when I look for stuff, like I've got to sort through a lot of chaff to kind of find this stuff. Um, and, and I feel like if, if I were a better bookseller, if I were more knowledgeable, I, I, could, I could spin like all the theology in the law into something really interesting, but I just, I don't have the context or the expertise. Um, but yeah, finding these gems among the thousands of newly listed items available each month is not easy. Um, and so this is just kind of an, an example of, of kind of what I work in on a daily basis. So this is just a brief description, no photos, not in English. Um, at least this, this description is not heavily abbreviated. There's one, my German is not great. There's one German auction house I, I buy from and it's just the most heavily abbreviated descriptions. It's a real slog. But you know, I saw the headline, it's a book with movable parts. Like, okay, yeah, that, that sounds interesting. What is this? Uh, you know, a photo would obviously be helpful to get a sense, um, it was not available. I couldn't find a digitized version of this particular edition, which is something I often look for uh, before buying something. Um, and, uh, and I, I really wanted to see what they were talking about. I did find another edition in Google Books. That's what the image here is. And it's like, I think something interesting is happening. You can kind of see text tucked behind that border decoration. Uh, but again, as mentioned earlier, I don't always really know what I'm buying. Um, so at this point, I was like, again, you know, I, I need to put out a catalog. I need inventory. It's like, what the hell? Let's put in a bid, try to keep my own selling price, you know, below whatever threshold I'm comfortable with, uh, which turned out to be just enough, um, and hope for the best. And that describes no small portion of my buying. I mean, remember that, you know, the, for me, the, the good surprises have outweighed the bad. And so I just kind of keep rolling with the unknown. And oh yeah, this will probably be my my last one for tonight. Uh, we're getting close to Q and A time. But this is this is one of like the one of the greatest books I've ever worked with. Um, so when I'm and, and it kind of touches on my uh, my approach as a bookseller in general, which is I typically look for things to which I can really add value through research, um, and that's in large part because I. Like I can't afford to buy the stuff with obvious value, uh, which fetch high prices and are then likely to, to sit on my shelves for a while um, until somebody comes along with the cash to buy it. Uh, you know, I'm trying to move stuff quickly and I feel like the, the, 
the best way for me to do that is to find um, underappreciated stuff and then through research add value that make them more appealing. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, buying high spots at high prices is, is not, uh, you know, a value. There's um, certainly there's undeniable value to sorting through all that chaff and just making things available to a given audience at a fixed price uh, at a given time. Um, it's, I mean, it's tremendously helpful for, for anyone who's building a collection. Um, but, you know, I want, I also want my customers to feel like, you know, they're getting some real intellectual labor for the money they're spending. Um, and basically it's kind of receive, again, I, I come from a, you know, a librarian background, you know, I want you to feel like you're getting a complete package in a way that you can trot into a classroom, plop into an exhibit with little to no notice. That's not to say you won't have your own take on something or be able to add, you know, much more of your own value. But I, I want you to feel like, you know, I, I know how swamped librarians are. And I, I want you to be able to kind of take these things into a given setting and have something kind of informed to say about them. Um, now, you know, when a book's value isn't obvious, obviously this is nece necessary just to sell the thing. And so I kind of need to do this as a matter of course. Um, and then doing this is, you know, I do it by expanding on the historical context. Uh, I might try to summarize the work and provide a few choice translations. Um, Sometimes, I mean, some of this, this stuff, like it's, it's gone completely unnoticed. You do a little translating, it's just hilarious um, and, and so incredibly illuminating. Um, and, and often these things kind of fly under the radar. There's, there are no summaries, synopses in the secondary literature. That's pretty common. Um, and so these are just kind of the ways I, I try to add value to things. Uh, and if I, to, to pick, like a favorite way um, to add value. It's kind of demonstrating the value of posterity's visual engagement with an item. Um, because at its best, this, this blends translation, summary, contextualization, interpretation, kind of all the things I, I love most about being a curator and a, a, a librarian. Um, and so for example, here's a, a daily calendar. You've seen the, this, you know, this kind uh, even today, it's sort of a one a day calendar with historical tidbits for each day, but it's been copiously annotated by a contemporary user. And I feel like copious is a word that gets thrown around, throw, thrown around a lot, but, um, but man, this was, this was a, another sort of next level annotation. Uh, and this kind of engagement is, is what I live for. The, the photo of, of the spread here is, um, uh, you know, certainly one of the, the, the fuller ones. All right, so there, yeah, I live for this kind of like readerly engagement. Um, and, and, and I guess this kind of, you know, bears also on, on what I deal in and why. So I, I, I deal primarily in non-English material from the hand press period, um, in part because I'm, I'm just fascinated by early print culture, which I said, uh, and I, I also, I enjoy languages. Um, and there's, you know, in the US at least, there's a relatively small group of dealers who, who focus on this stuff exclusively. And when there are so many dealers doing great things already with Anglo-American material, this just kind of seemed for me like the, the best bet for me to maybe make a living at this. Um, and so I, I set a pretty strict date cut off of 1830, which may seem limiting, but it's actually been a tremendous boon when shopping because I can just ignore whole swaths of the market and really focus my time and energy in this much smaller slice. So uh, when I bought it, I knew it had lots of annotations, some additional manuscript material at the front and back, uh, but I had little sense of the character and the content of these annotations. Now, in, in most cases, you know, the, the annotated books I've dealt with, annotations are of kind of the, the nota bene variety or, or kind of the general finding aid, just kind of marking a passage that the reader wants to be able to return to with maybe a, a key word in the margin to kind of uh, help, help guide them. Um, but this one, this like book really brought all the feels. Uh, you know, it was published in 1571. And the one of the owners, a string of owners from the same family. And one of the owners um, uh, reflected on his wife's death several years later. Uh, there are numerous reports of plague deaths. Um, you can see on the left, uh, a small annotation in Iceland in this month, 346 mortals died from plague. 
Um, and here's the yeah, on the right. On this day, my wife was carried off by plague, struck down before her handmaid. Um, there is a passage in there where it, it, it mentions a, a child who has died, and they, they call him uh, Andreas Ernestulus. It's that Ernestulus, which is sort of the Latin diminutive of Ernestus, just little Ernst. And you, can, you really get a sense of who these people are and kind of the, the tragedy. Um, and there are proud moments too. You know, there's a graduation from Wittenberg University. And this is just one of those books. There have only been a few that have really nearly brought me to tears and kind of been like emotionally draining to catalog. Um, man, I get sad just thinking about it now. But happier things, you guys have the book. That's what matters. Um, and, you know, when, and I guess, you know, that's sort of a, a good note to end on. Um, with this book, it's it's easy, especially when things are in four languages and centuries old, it's easy to overlook the simple fact that the people who use these books were real human beings. Uh, they had dreams, they had sorrows, triumphs, tragedies. I mean, they were, they were people. They were engaged with their books just like you and I do, so. All right, that's it. I'll uh, go ahead and, and open it up to questions.